All right, we're continuing to study how Satan attacks us. And remember last week we, we began this by re reading Ephesians 6, 10 to 14 and 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. And I'll just uh, remind us of those verses, 2 Corinthians 10, where Paul said, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war or fight according to the flesh. For the weapons of the warfare that we're fighting are not human, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, throwing down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This talks about the spiritual battle that is going on for the minds of people. And that's where the battle is. It's a battle for people's minds. And remember, in the Bible, the word heart means mind. So Satan wants to get people's minds and hearts away from God. And that's why Paul tells us here we need to watch out. And we need to make sure that we use the right weapons to reject those arguments that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. That's why Satan got cast out of heaven to start with. He tried to be God. He tried to lift himself up above God. And so then he came to earth, and he began to do the same thing on the earth. We looked last week at the first two uh, ways that he undermined, he, he t attacks. Number one, he tried to undermine God's character and, and credibility. He did that in Genesis 3, where he told Adam and Eve, God didn't really, God didn't really tell the truth to you he didn't want you to be like him he didn't want you to be God and Satan lied and I thought about this today how can you tell when a liar is lying here's how you can tell this is a my spinoff of the old joke you know what I'm going to say, don't you, Heidi? I think so. Their, their lips are moving. That's how you can tell when a liar is lying. Their lips are moving. Now, Satan doesn't have lips, so to speak, but whenever Satan speaks, he's lying. And, and I, didn't, I didn't bring out that, that part of it, uh, so let me bring that out. I gave you the verse um, many times, John 8, 44, but let me just, let's see that in the verse, okay, about whenever his lips move, he's lying, all right, uh, whenever he speaks, because that's in this verse, and it, I never even thought of that till right now tonight. John chapter 8, verse 44. Now watch, watch what Jesus says. You are of your father, the devil. And the de desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, now watch this. When, a, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar. And the father of lies. So when Satan speaks, whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He never tells the truth. He never tells the truth. And if it sounds like the truth, he's twisting it. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we really need to remember. So we talked about this last week. He tries to undermine God's character and credibility. And then second, he tries to make it hard to live the Christian life through persecution and peer pressure and through nominal like Christianity, which is not really Bible Christianity at all. Jesus said, if any man wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Number three tonight, we'll start with this point. He attacks us by trying to confuse with false teaching. The word doctrine means teaching. He confuses with false doctrine. And what he does is he tries to present to Christians many different interpretations of the Bible in order to confuse people. Now, there's a good verse that you should know about, 
1 Corinthians 14, 33, where Paul writes to the church and he says, do all things decently and in order. God is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. So I ask you, if God is not the author of confusion, who is the author then? Well, there's only two. There's only two primaries in the world. There's God, and then there's Satan. So if God's not the author of confusion, but he's the author of peace, then Satan is the author of confusion. And he wants people to be confused. That's why there's so many different interpretations of the Bible. And in Ephesians 4, 14, notice what Paul said there in, in warning the church at Ephesus. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 14. Paul is speaking here about the job of the pastors and the teachers. So I'll go back to verse 12. He, he gave pastor teachers to the church for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature perfect, the word perfect means mature individual, to the measure, now watch this, the measure that we have is the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we measure ourselves by Jesus, not by other people. And then look at verse 14. God's will is that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So we're not supposed to be tossed about with every wind of doctrinal teaching by men's trickery. And that's what's going on today. People are getting all confused and all topsy-turvy. And I think one of the reasons this is happening is because People don't know their Bibles. Because the word doctrine just means teaching, all right? That's what it means. Doctrine means teaching. So if you ask the average Christian today, what are some of the major teachings of the Bible? If they said that they're a born-again believer, they would probably say, well, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again, and that's the gospel. That's, that, that's right. But if you ask him some more deeper questions and say, that's good, now let's talk about some more teachings of the Bible. What does the Bible have to say about your sins and about your standing before Christ and your position? What does the Bible say about justification or sanctification? Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to know those big words, but the problem is people don't even know what that's all about at all. And so it's very easy if they don't know anything besides the fact that Jesus died for your sins and you believe in him and you have eternal life. If that's all they know, they know enough to get to heaven. I understand that. Okay, You can, you can repent of your sins and be saved by putting all your faith and trust in Jesus plus nothing. That will get you to heaven. But that will not fortify you against false teachers who come along and say, well, we believe in Jesus too, but did you know that he's not really God? He is a God with a little g. And did you know that Jesus actually was a half-brother to Satan? And that's what people are being told today by one of the huge, big false cults that a lot of people don't realize because it, it dresses itself up in Christian terminology. 
and it uh, has a huge big choir that you know people love and they have wonderful music at the temples but a lot of people don't realize that 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 those doctrines are not in the Bible see? and so it's easy for people to get led astray if they don't know what the Bible says about Jesus say, being God. And that's John 1.1, 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now that phrase, Word, in John 1.1 1, 1 means Jesus. That's talking about the Lagos, Jesus. He's the Word. He's the living Word. And the Bible says he's God. The cults, and there's two big ones, they don't believe that Jesus is God, but to get Christians sucked in, they'll say he's a God with a little g. And if people don't know their Bibles, then they don't know any better. See? And it's really, it's a sad thing. It's insidious. And by the way, that's not all that's confusing people. The people are confused by many different false teachings. Uh, and let me show you in 2 Corinthians 11, that Satan has ministers today. Did you know that? Now I can right away hear somebody, especially if they're listening to this online, say, well, how do we know you're not one of Satan's ministers? And that's a good question. I don't take offense at that. But let me show you, all right? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. What does the Bible say about Satan having ministers? All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is a, the point there under three where it says, false teachers come in sheep's clothing, all right? 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. Paul says, and he's talking here about himself, he's contrasting himself and false apostles, all right? And he says, but what I do, I will continue to do. So I can cut off the opportunity for those who desire an opportunity to be like regarded like we are. In other words, to call themselves apostles. For such people, he says, are, watch this, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. What he means is they are fake. They are counterfeit. They make themselves look like apostles of Christ. Now watch where they come from, the next verse. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. No wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into a what? Angel, Angel of light. Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Now watch whose ministers they are. He says, his ministers, the his in verse 15 refers back to Satan. Satan himself transforms himself, and therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves. Do you, do you see that? You see the connection? So they're ministers of Satan. And by the way, they don't call themselves satanic high priests. They, they, they are in churches as preachers, pastors, priests, rabbis, you know, all, all different denominations have ministers who Satan is using. And that's a shame that people don't know the Bible any better, so they are easily led astray. Now, notice this thing, Satan transformed himself into an angel of light. Let me, I'll give you an illustration of that. Um, it's a little bit, um, I don't want to say controversial, but it's a, it's a little um, out of the ordinary, but it, it's, it's happened. How many of you have ever read about people having out-of-body experiences? Yeah. Okay. Now, 
All right, let me just say this. First of all, if you had one and you're listening to this, I'm not going to argue with you about your experience, all right? Because, and that's, by the way, don't ever, when you're witnessing, don't ever try to argue with somebody's experience because you can't win. You can't say to them, you, that didn't happen to you. See, that, you, you're on no logical ground to say that. Now, you may have a different opinion as to why it happened to them, but you can't prove it to those people unless it's something from the Bible, right? But a lot of people had these out-of-body experiences. They would die on op hospital operating uh, tables. And then they would be, you know, dead for 30 seconds or dead for a minute. And they would come back. And many times they would come back and talk about how they saw this being of light. And I, I did a lot of research on this way back 20, 25 years ago when a couple books first came out. And I did even a sermon on the subject. So I'm just giving you this from my memory bank. But I remember that many people said they, they went down, th they went through this long, dark kind of tunnel, and when they get to the end, there was, an, there was a being of light, and the being of light was welcoming them and saying, come, come, and greeting them. And then the surgeon or the hospital operating team, they were able to resuscitate them, and they bring, brought them back. And they talked about how sad they were to come back because of how wonderful this being of light was. Now, here's what I want you to know about that. Some people say, well, that was Jesus, of course, because Jesus said, I am the light. Well, here's what you need to know in the research about these people. Now, this, I'm not saying this is true of all the people that this happened to, but in many of the cases, the people said afterwards that what this caused them to do, this experience with seeing this being of light, caused them to, number one, not be afraid of death anymore. And number two, it caused them just to want to be a better person and try to help people more. None of the people that I read about ever said it caused them to want to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. All right? That, that wasn't their experience. So to me, that's a, that's a uh, right on the nose illustration of Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. And by the way, it's not hard for him to do that because what was his name before he got kicked out of heaven? You remember Satan's name in heaven? He, he was the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God. And he was called, he was called Lucifer, which means light bearer. Lucifer, the light bearer. I've always been skeptical. Lucis. Lucis is light. I do have an answer for someone who said they went to heaven and back. Yeah. John 3.13. Paul, Paul said that he was, he was lifted up, but he didn't, wasn't even allowed to speak of it. Is that what you're talking about? No, on John 3.13, Jesus said, he's the only one that went to heaven. And no one goes to heaven and comes back again. Except oh, okay, him. yeah. And Paul said that he was caught up in the third heaven, but, he, but God, he was forbidden to say anything about it. He wasn't allowed to speak about it. See? So um, Satan is an angel of light where he needs to be. And he does that to deceive people, to keep people from believing in Jesus. Because, look at, look at back at 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, If our gospel is hidden, verse 3, 2 Corinthians 4.3, If our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are lost. Now watch the next verse whose minds the God, there's a little g, the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe so that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So Satan blinds the minds of those who don't believe so that the gospel, the light of the gospel, won't shine on them. See, that's his whole deal. His whole deal is keeping people from believing in Jesus Christ keeping people 
from receiving the light of the gospel. And if he can use light to do it, he will. If he can use sin to do it, he will. He doesn't care what he uses. He'll use whatever works on individuals. And there's lots and lots of false doctrine, false teaching that we could, you know, talk about tonight, but, but time doesn't really permit me. But I had made a list here of, uh, of some of Satan's lies. I might do a whole, another whole sermon just on this list. I got eight, eight lies here of Satan. No God, evolution, transgender, gay marriage, sex with anyone, any age, life begins at birth, not conception, relativity, man's his own boss, and there's no afterlife, so there's no accountability. All those are lies of Satan, aren't they? And a lot of people say that. A lot of people think, well, I've, there's no heaven, there's no hell, this, this world's it. So just eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die, right? That's how a lot of people want to believe that, because they don't want to believe that they're going to have to stand before God and answer for their life someday. Right? So he confuses with false doctrine. Number four, Satan also hinders. He tries to hinder our service to Christ. And you might wonder, well, does he really try to do that? Well, he actually, absolutely he tries to do that. I didn't say he does it, but he tries to do it because he tried to do it with Jesus. Go back in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, please. And this is a chapter in the Gospel of Matthew that we know as the temptation of Jesus, the temptation of the Christ. Matthew chapter 4. He did it to try to get Jesus to not go to the cross. That was his purpose. And I'll pick it up. The Bible says, after he fasted 40 days, he was hungry. So Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And the tempter came to him, verse 3. Verse 1 says he was led there to be tempted by the devil. And the Spirit led him into the wilderness, the Holy Spirit. Not The Spirit wasn't tempting him, but the devil was going to tempt him. So the tempter came to him, and he said, verse 3, If, notice the if, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, let me show you something. Jesus Christ answered the devil with Scripture correctly, correctly interpreted and spoken. Satan tried to tempt Jesus by misquoting, misinterpreting Scripture. And, and that's what you have to be careful of because the devil can use the Bible, the misuse the Bible, to try to get people off track. That's what he tried to do with Jesus here. Watch what he said. He said, command these stones to become bread. Jesus answered. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, to the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God. And notice each time he's casting aspersions on Jesus' deity. If you are the son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written. Now watch this. Here he, gives, he quotes scripture. It is written, Satan said, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they'll bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So there he misuses that scripture, and Jesus spoke back to him and said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then finally, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And Satan said to Jesus, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, many people say and think when they read that, well, the devil was lying because he couldn't give Jesus those things. Well, don't forget, Satan's called the God of this world, right? Mm -hmm. So Satan could have given Jesus the kingdoms of the world, all right? But Jesus didn't need Satan to do that. And G Satan is answered by Jesus, Away with you, Satan. 
For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall worship. And the Bible says, then the devil left him. Now, I have written in, next to that verse, next to verse 10, next to verse 11, I have written this scripture, Luke 4.13. Do you know what Luke 4.13 says? It says, then the devil left him until a more opportune time. So Satan doesn't give up even on Jesus. Luke, what was that? Luke 4, 13. But notice what it says next. It says the devil left him, and behold, angels came. Those are good angels, good spirits, and ministered to Jesus. So the devil is able to quote scripture Jesus quoted scripture right back at him and he correctly recognized that he didn't need to do what Satan wanted him to do. And you know what Satan was really trying to do? He was trying to, he was trying to get Jesus to not go to the cross. See, that's what he wanted. He wanted to short circuit that because Jesus going to the cross and dying on the cross was going to be the defeat of Satan, as prophesied in Genesis 3.15. And, and Jesus would also, when he died on the cross and rose again, he would get all this. And Satan's tempting him to say, you don't have to suffer, you don't have to die, you don't have to go through pain for all these people who don't like you. Just do what I'm asking you to do, and you can have it all now, see. You can have a shortcut. Sometimes the devil offers us shortcuts, doesn't he? See. So he tried to hinder Jesus. Uh, how about Matthew 16, 23? Matthew 16, 23, and I only got three more minutes. Matthew 16, 23, let me show you one more, one more scripture. And this, the Catholics aren't going to like this scripture, I'm sorry. Matthew 16, 23. The people that are Catholic, Roman Catholic, and I, I'm not knocking the Catholic Church, but I'm just trying to show you what the Bible says, and the Catholic Church says it believes the Bible, so, you know, uh, they, they, of course, say that Peter's the first pope, but Peter, Peter's not the first pope, all right? Here's how I know Peter was not the first pope. Peter was never a pope, because notice in Matthew 16, 23, Jesus told his disciples in verse 21 that he was going to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed and raised the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Notice what Peter did. He began to rebuke Jesus saying, Oh no, Lord, this will not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me. What's the next word? Satan. Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you do not understand, you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. There, Satan tried to use Peter to stop Jesus. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, you don't, you don't even get it. You don't even understand. You're being, you're letting yourself be used by the devil to try to stop me from going to the cross, and that's why I came. I came to this world. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Any questions about either of those two instances, Matthew or uh, 4 or Matthew 16? Now, we'll talk next week about how Satan tried to hinder Paul, and uh, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 16, 9, and 1 Thessalonians 2, 8. Then we'll get into the, to the uh, thorny subject of division in the church. <laughs> Satan tries to cause division in the church, and it usually comes from all kinds of stupid things. You know that? Really. People argue about stupid things whether the carpet's going to be red or 
screen. <laughs> Things that are of no consequence. Now, here's what you need to repair. I'll, I'll close with this verse for you. James 4, 7, and, and this is what Jesus did. He defeated the devil by doing this. James 4, 7 says, Surrender yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And Jesus resisted the devil with Scripture, didn't he? He knew the Bible, and he quoted it. And the last part of that verse says that he will flee from you. Right? That's God's promise. So you don't have to be afraid of Satan's attacks, but you need to be prepared. You need to know God's word and be prepared to use it. All right, let's close with a word of prayer.